Rocky TV, uh, trying to set everything up. It's just me today, no Ken, uh, Western New York here. The weather is, you know, it's mediocre. It's been better. Uh, let's see, what do we have on tap today? Well, for today's ZDTV, we'll be doing a working session. I'll take you through using Java and Golang for um, accessing a totally private Postgres database. And I'm also going to host that database in Amazon, just demonstrating the power of you know, OpenZD, the reach that you get from OpenZD, and the ease that it takes you know, a developer who's modestly seasoned to get through actually doing this. And so this is what we're gonna be doing today. Um, oftentimes, if there is any sort of updates to uh, uh, OpenZD itself, I will read the change log. And so you can see there is a new release of OpenZD version 0 0.31.0, adds in rate limiting modes for model changes. So if you have a very, very big network, you need to be cognizant of how you roll changes out. And so a rate limiter was added. Uh, it says to prevent the controller from being overwhelmed by a flood of changes, the rate limiter is enacted and tells you about what it is and how it works and gives you a little information, asks you to upgrade your open API spec and regenerate your clients so that if you have one, you'll now have the new fields. A uh, whole bunch of bugs get fixed every single release. So uh, you can go and check those out if you're interested. New dependencies. Um, 0.30.5, I think, also came out. And it included the idea of proxy support. So if you are uh, desiring to send all of your traffic through a particular proxy, you can do that. Oh, and the sun has just come out. So it's time to close that blind just a little bit more. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's the release notes for today. Let's go ahead and just start playing around in Java. And so a request came in on our discourse, our, our forum. Let's see if I can find that really quickly. We have a new friend out there exercising a whole bunch of parts of OpenZD and found this using the JVM or the SDK JVM. And so a year later, found a nice post. This is the whole idea that what discourse is for. So we can, people can find these posts and says, hey, I'm trying to follow the Postgres example. Here's my Docker Compose file. I'm having some problems. I replied back and said, hey, I'll go and make a new video. So if you haven't seen the totally private Postgres update over 2023, go on ahead and check it out or just keep watching, ask some questions here too. Oh, by the way, it's also an office hours. So if you want to chat, throw a chat into the chat, whichever one you're at, too many, too much alliteration. And we'll, uh, we'll see the chat here and hopefully I'll respond to it and have a, have an answer for you. Otherwise sit back, relax and enjoy this ZD TV where we start off our adventure with Java and Docker. All right. So I was out playing around on my, uh, Amazon machine before this call. And so let's bring this onto the screen. And so not that. So uh, out here, you can see I've uh, I've got a couple of windows on the top and the bottom. They'll they'll both be this Ubuntu machine that's out in the Amazon cloud somewhere. First thing I'll do is I'll go back to that discourse post. Actually, what I should do is I should reference the cheat sheet and whatnot inside of the post. So I'll do that too. So if we go ahead and go over to, where's my browser window again? You got, not the YouTube. <laughs> YouTube, I want the actual URL. I don't want your link. Thank you very much. Let's see. I got to click. I put the link into the YouTube description. And so here's the cheat sheet. But what I really want to do is I wanted to see this JDBC Postgres sample. So if you go out to GitHub, and you find the ZDSDK JVM, you'll find the samples folder, you'll find JDBC Postgres. And this readme does link to the video that I was just talking about, but it also links to the cheat sheet, which basically takes you through the commands that you'll need in order to uh, accomplish this. Now I also do have a whole entire uh, 
PowerPoint deck that I also built that I used in that video. And we can take a look at that real quick too. And you'll see basically what we'll do is we'll be adding uh, ZD plus, in this case, Golang. It should be Java. I don't know why it says Golang. Now I want to know if I... Okay, good. I have two different videos I was going to do, one for Golang and one for Java. Um, and this is the overall setup. We're going to have the Golang, or in this case, Java SDK, and we'll have a controller, we'll have an edge router, all in Docker Compose land, and we'll add Postgres to it. And so uh, that's what we'll end up doing. And so that's what we're going to do right now. If we take a look back over on the website, if I find it, here it is. We go to that cheat sheet. All right, you'll see there's some setup work. First, you'll need Java installed. I, mean, I think that's obvious, but if not, go and install Java, pause the video, come back, we'll wait. All right, thanks for coming back. Um, now you clone, it doesn't say to clone the repository, it just assumes that you've already cloned it. So let's go right ahead and, and check out my JVM. I've already cloned the ZD JVM samples. You can see this is all the same commands to CD to the location. Um, once I've done that, I can then go ahead and download the Docker Compose file, the simplified one, and the Docker uh, environment that goes along with it. Go ahead and do that now. What we're going to do that for is, um, so we can RM our Docker Compose file, RM our environment, and we can curl both of those down. So we'll go get the Docker Compose. We'll go get the EMV file. Maybe I will update that EMV file. Actually, I'm going to update it right now. So see that by default, it'll ask you to add a password and it'll ask you for a little bit of information. I'm going to use the standard default ports that we often tell people to use. So the controller's advertised port will be 8440. The controller's edge advertised port will be 8441 and the router port will be 8444. Uh, this machine has an external DNS property set. So I'm going to use that as my advertised address for all of these things too. So let's go ahead and update this. And update this. And we'll update this. All right, so that should be all I need to do, that and a password. Now, I'm gonna do this little bit off the screen so that you can't see my password. And I'm gonna write, and I'm gonna quit that file, and I'm gonna bring it back here. So now I should be able to do a Docker Compose up. I'm gonna do a down minus V first because I noticed a small bug when I was doing this before. I think we added, um, in fact, you know what I'll do? Down here. I will look at the Docker Compose file. We added some tests and a number of retries, and these retries, not sufficient. So I'm going to actually uh, upgrade this to 90 retries because I don't know how long it particularly takes. I just know it takes more than 30. So I'm going to update that so that when I run my Docker Compose up, before it was failing, Compose up. And what this will do is it will go out and it will create my entire OpenZD overlay network, which will consist of one edge router and one controller, the bare minimum necessary to have an OpenZD overlay. While that happens down here, I can do a Docker compose logs on the ZD, if I can spell it, controller, and uh, minus F. We'll watch those logs. So we'll see this as it goes by and we'll see that it gets up and running and there we go we can see a couple of errors that's no problem the network's coming online the router's coming online and i don't know why the docker compose file up above is no longer reflecting these logs it certainly used to um something is something is blocking these logs from succeeding so We'll have to get that fixed. But you can see, if I come down here and do a docker ps minus a, you'll see that I do have, uh, let me make it a little bit smaller so I can read it. All right. There it is. You'll see I have a quick start latest running on port 3022, which is not correct. And port 
8440 and 8441 for the controller. I have to look up, now I have to look up to see why my port's wrong, because this is not going to work if my port is incorrect. So give me one moment while I'm off screen here. I'm gonna look to see if I added that port. I did add that port, and somehow the ZD router listener bind port is no longer being referenced. It's, that's another bug. The Docker Compose, and we'll look at actually we'll look at Edge. Now we we'll just go down. Controller, Edge router. Here it is. Ah, I see. So I set the ZD router listener bind port, but I don't think I set the ZD router port. So I'm going to go and set that now. Excuse me, I had to sneeze. I had to put you on mute for a second there. I had to sneeze again. All right, I'm looking for ZD router port. Ah, I did. I just missed it. It's in there. So let me bring this back on screen. You'll see I just missed it. The ZD router port is indeed part of the template. I just forgot to update it. So let's change that. Stop the Docker Compose so that I can apply it again. Whenever Docker decides to run, be nice. I'm letting it stop gracefully. I could I could forcefully stop it. I could also uh, dump everything. Let's see. Now what happens? All right, there's that. So now if I do a docker ps minus a i don't need a minus a but docker ps there we are now we see 8442 8444 8440 8441 perfect that's great i'm going to stop this because i know the very next step in my uh steps here is to actually and the reason why i'm using the web page here as opposed to the file which you can find here is just because notice the indentations in markdown you have to indent extra in order for it to be detected as a code block. And so if you read the rendered file, you'll see that the spacing is sufficient and correct so that you can just flip back over and modify your Docker Compose file. And so that's what I'm gonna do now. And of course, VI always wants to do that to me. All right, and I'm, I like my spaces. So now I have a new Postgres database. It has no ports exposed on it. It's going to be running inside of Amazon, inside of Docker, inside of Amazon. It's going to set up a database directory with a username Postgres, uh, user Postgres, sorry, database Postgres, user Postgres, password Postgres. Wonderful. There we go. Now we can do a Docker compose up. All right. It's going to pull Postgres because I haven't, actually I did a system prune prior to starting the ZDTV today. And off that goes. So now when this is done, we're gonna have a database that's running out here in Amazon. I'm gonna shrink this top window down because I don't wanna see it. My, it's, it's in, in our exiting, that's perfectly fine. We'll do our Docker PS again. And we should now see a Postgres container. Here it is with port 5432 not exposed and super, we're good. The next step is it says launch the Docker environment. We've already done that. Now I should, in fact, you know what? Let's just follow the actual instructions. So I'm going to Docker compose down minus V with this, remove everything. And then I'll Docker compose minus P for the project name Postgres. And we'll send that up. While that happens, the Postgres database comes online very quickly. So we'll go ahead and Docker, actually, we don't need the Docker copy. I've got to change that. We just need the Docker exec. And so what this will do is it will get us into that Docker database. There we are. We're now in the Docker database in AWS inside of Docker. We'll drop the database, recreate the simple database, and then change to the simple database. We'll just insert some data. This is just silly data to represent my silly database, right? And we select star from simple table just to make sure that we're actually getting data back and that it works correctly and whatnot. 
Again, also in office hours, so if you have any burning questions about OpenZD, please do ask them. Now we exit Postgres. And then I've already shown that Docker was not exposed. So now I'm I'm ready. I'm ready to do let's let's do our Docker PS minus A. Make sure ZD's running. Make sure it's on port 8442, 8444. Everything looks good. We should be able to down curl minus S to HTTPS. Kernel DNS uh, 8.4.4.1. And that complained. What did it complain about? That should be available. It's not available. Okay. Well, we have our first mystery. That should certainly seems like it works. Let's click on it and see what happens. Okay. Well, I mean, it's definitely alive. It's out there. It's responding. Why is curl... Oh, <laughs> minus S, not minus K. I wanted SK. There we go. Uh, minus S. That's the, uh, any messaging. So if I did that curl, I would have seen, hey, your certificate is not um, a valid certificate because it's a self-signed certificate. And that's what the K does. It says trust that certificate. And so minus K, minus S, easy to uh, conflate. And that's what I did. All right, so our overlay network is up and running. Our Postgres database is provisioned. Uh, let's see, um, if I don't have ZD on my path, I can run this particular command. So is ZD on my path? It's not. So I'll just copy that command, I'll add ZD to my path. It'll go download the latest version. Now this is added to my path because I said, where's the quote? Yes, I gave it a get ZD and I said, yes, that just adds it to my path. And now log in. Uh, this is not my password, so that will not work. So what I'll do is off screen, I'll go set that password. One second. So let's do an, uh, a, uh, boop, 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 boop. Let's see. So we'll do DTPWD equals. I don't even know if that's the right password. Let me source the Z. Uh, I gotta go in Docker to get this. One second. Docker exec minus uh, it cd pg cd controller. Remember my password. <laughs> cd, come on. cd controller dash one dash echo cd pwd. That's what I thought it was. It was I actually did remember my password. Uh, export cd pwd equals that clear the screen so now I'm back again I can copy this paste this here and instead of password I'll do zdpwd and connection was refused because I used local host and 1280 Let's see I should be able to do local host 8441 and there we go we are logged in successfully. So now ZD Edge List ERs shows me my Edge router and shows that it's online. All right, cool. Uh, these are cleanup commands. I don't need these. Now I'm going to do the create update commands. First thing, I need an identity. This is going to give my Java program access to the Postgres database. I'm going to send the output to this pg minus client.jwt file. And I'm going to give it an attribute of Postgres clients. And I'm going to use Postgres clients, that attribute, later on to assign privileges to this identity in order to dial a service. I'll enroll the identity. I don't know why I'm doing that here. I should do that locally. So let's uh, just pull this file down locally. Where is my samples? Where did I put this? It's in work, git, github. Okay, I know where it is. So if I go to... It on Windows, let's see, DD, SDK, JVM, and then where am I? A JVM samples. Then I want to go to JDBC, and then right there is where I want. All right, so here I'm going to SCP my file from Clint AWS called PG Client to here. And no PG client. It's because it's in November 10th, the folder, November 10th. Okay. See if that fixes this. 
no V. Oh, that's why. No hyphen. There it is. PG client. Now I got my database uh, access locally. All right. Uh, now I need to authorize the edge router to be a server of the Postgres database. Now, this Postgres database is running inside of Docker, inside of Amazon. So when I authorize my router to offload traffic back to the underlay, the router needs to be able to access the Postgres database. So if I had run the router outside of Docker, I would have had to allow a hole into my Docker world for Postgres. That makes sense, right? Right now there's a hole through the Amazon firewall into my router, which is actually a hole into my Docker Compose environment. So it comes from the internet into Amazon, into my local machine, into Docker, and then into my router. So I've got a, a few layers involved here, but because it's all running within the Docker space, if I were to exec into the uh, router container, this is how you, you would generally test Docker exec into uh, PG CD edge router uh, minus IT interactive. From here, I should be able to issue a netcat. Do I have NC? Yeah, a netcat to the uh, Postgres database, SSC AWS. Yes. Uh, well, that's uh, off the screen. Let's see. So it's called PG Postgres DB. Postgres DB is the actual name in the Docker file. So I should be able to first ping Postgres DB. And you can see I can. I can post. I can ping the Postgres DB. So now I should be able to netcat to Postgres DB 5432. Actually, let's give it a minus V. Because if you see a succeeded, it means you were successfully able to connect from this router to the Postgres database. And that's necessary. So in order to continue, now I need to allow that edge router the capability, the I need to authorize it to be able to dial this particular service or the services that have the attribute of Postgres servers. And I'm only using an attribute just because I can. There we go. Now I've updated the identity. So if I do a ZD edge list identities now, you'll see my edge router has the Postgres servers attribute. My client has the Postgres clients attribute. And that's important because that's go, that goes back to that idea of authorization, ZD all about authentication and authorization. Just having that strong identity gets you access to the network, but not authorization to do anything on the network. Now our SDKs do things a little differently. Uh, every SDK, every um, programming language and runtime gives you different access to different things. And in Java, one of the ways that we are able to tap into the ecosystem of the Java runtime is by using a, a socket factory. So when you ask Java for a socket, you can actually override the socket factory and say, hey, instead of dialing, you know, whatever you told me to dial, then use this implementation. And that's how ZD will work under the hood. And there's also, I think, asynchronous channels too. There's, But the idea is uh, my code asks the JVM to make a connection. ZD allows you to uh, tap into that ecosystem and provide a different socket than, uh, say, an underlay-based socket. In order to find the ZD service, that's going to be dialed. We use an intercept and an, an intercept in ZD parlance is a uh, piece of configuration that is also useful for your tunnelers, but is also useful for some SDKs. So for example, if you recall, every most people will have a tunneler involved because not everybody has, oh, I turned on the wrong tunneler. I don't even know if I have the right one. I don't even have the right one uh, installed. I only have the new one. Oh no, it's right there new icon. I didn't see it. So uh, most people, if you're running Windows, you'll have a tunneler that looks like this, or you'll have a tunneler that looks like the new UI right here. And so this tunneler allows you to intercept whatever DNS entry you want. And so that's what these intercepts are. They are the configuration that instructs the overlay network what to intercept. And you can see here, we want to intercept TCP, and we want the address 
to be Z defined Postgres. And we want any port from the low to the high, in this case, a single port, always least privilege, the smallest amount necessary. So we can go ahead and make the um, configuration, the ZD intercept V1 configuration. You can see new config created. Now we've got to do the same thing, but we have to authorize the server to be able to dial or offload traffic back onto the underlay. So overlay network, the OpenZD overlay network, the, the network that's built on top of the underlay network. That's why it's called an overlay versus an underlay, underlay being IP based network. Here, we're going to authorize our edge router to be able to contact the Postgres database on port 5432. And so we've now authorized them. Finally, we make a service that knits those two configurations together. A service is just a, a bunch of configurations, zero to many, knitted together. And if you're working in a Java or Go-based or SDK-based world, you don't actually need any configurations. Um, if it's your service, if you're just dialing your service. And we can see that later on when we inspect the appetizer stuff. But for now, we're going to go ahead and do this in Java. And so in Java, we're going to want that intercept. We're going to want the service. And so we'll net those two configurations together because we don't have application embedded zero trust on the far side. We have to use zero trust network access on the far side. So we have to authorize that identity to offload the, the traffic back to the underlay. And we do that by making a service and giving it some configs. All right. Finally, we do the authorization step. Here's where we were talking. Hello, mouse. Here's what we were talking about before, the dial policy. I want Postgres clients to be able to dial the private Postgres services. Any service that has this role, these identities will be able to dial. You can see before when I made my service, I used private Postgres services. And so let's authorize our clients to be able to dial and let's authorize our servers the right to host or bind that service. And that's it. Now we should be done. Whoops, I clicked on this and it brought me here. All right, now, since I'm using legitimate hosts, I'm not using ZD Edge controller. I'm not using ZD Edge router. I'm using legitimate hosts. Uh, I don't have to worry about a hosts file. I have a Amazon machine that I installed all this stuff onto. That's, in fact, you could go out there now and test it if you're interested. Well, maybe not now. It depends on if you're watching this live or not, I guess. So now we can run our sample. Uh, if I am in, let's go back to my uh, GDBC Postgres. I need to go to, yeah, this is the right one. Uh, if I'm in the right location, I can now do a Gradle, run the Gradle task, run, and give it some args. In this case, the arg is PG client one. Before we do that, let's go back and actually look at the code. Let's look at the actual Java here. So uh, relatively short program, 65 total lines. Um, you can see the, the common public static void main, uh, args one or arg zero, right? Uh, arg zero is expected to be the identity location. And if you don't supply it, it will look for the identity in slash temp. So if you're running a Mac or Linux, you're fine. If you're running on windows, you know, you probably should supply an arg. Uh, let's see if it doesn't exist. It tells you it can't find the file. All this is a boilerplate. Here's our magic. So we call this zd.init function, a static function on this zd class. And we give it an identity location. We give it a empty char array, which I assume is some sort of password. I actually don't know. Let's go look at the init function. Yep, it's some password. I'm not exactly sure what the password is for because I'm not going to use it and I've never actually made use of it. I should probably know that answer but I don't. And then seamless mode is false. Seamless mode is interesting. Uh, certain, not runtimes, certain libraries uh, do different things and use different parts of Java. And this is kind of, it's a double-edged sword sometimes where you have to know that you are not running in seamless mode or you are running in seamless mode. And um, I think Eugene would probably be the best person to ask about that. I don't know if we document what seamless mode actually means very well. If I hover over the init function, I don't get any Java doc that helps me. So maybe I'll talk to Eugene and 
get some Java doc or, or actually document this in the sample at very least what seamless mode entails. Um, I don't recall at this time, uh, but we're going to use a UDB, uh, UDBC, <laughs> a URL for our JDBC driver. We're going to tell it to use the Postgres driver and we're going to use a host name called Zetified Postgres. Go back to my computer here and I ping, not ping, ping Zetified Postgres. It'll come as no surprise that this is not an actual host name, right? Like this is one that I've made up fictitiously, but if you'll recall, it represents or it is it is represented by the intercept address that I used in our configuration. So here in Java land, I'm going to be using this fictitious intercept that I created as the host name or the DNS entry where my driver will use to connect to Postgres. I'll connect to that simple DB, use the username and password of Postgres, and then tell the, the JDBC driver to use the ZD socket factory. We talked a little bit about that moments ago, very important. You obviously need the driver to use that factory. Otherwise you're going to try to connect to the underlay and that won't work. We're just going to select start from table and print it out the, the results. And that's what this ends up doing. Very, very simple stuff, but hope, you know, that's the idea of a sample, right? We don't want to overload you with too much information too quickly. So now we can go ahead and run Gradle W by the way, uh, if you're not familiar with Gradle W, that is a little script that is always left behind by a Gradle project. It does make it easy to run a project. It'll self bootstrap itself if it needs to. Well, off it goes, doing its Gradle things, compiling to Java, and then it'll end up running this. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And if everything works here, whenever it's done, whenever it's done. There it goes. Okay. Oof. I don't know why it takes so long. Uh, I, I don't, if, I don't know if I can make it an executable, but somehow when you run the thing the first time, not the first time, every time you start it up, every time you bootstrap your JVM, you know, it is, it's a little sluggish, but there we are. We have it. We have our results from the database. Um, we got all 10 results and we've successfully connected to a database that's in Amazon that has no port 5432 exposed and also uh, is inside a Docker that also has no port 5432 exposed. And yet we could do that all through OpenZD. Mind bending, cool stuff. The other thing I really love about this in fact, I kind of want to, I kind of want to do it. Let's see. Let's see if I can do it live, right? I want to move that database. Am I able to move that database someplace else and have it all work? Maybe I'll, it's already 1133. Maybe I'll set that up for the end. I do want to go through doing this ex exact same thing with Java, sorry, with Golang too. So there's our um, Java example. I haven't pushed any Golang code out there, but let's look at what it looks like in Golang. Uh, I talked a little bit before about how various platforms are better than others or different than others when it comes to um, the libraries and what you can do in the libraries and, and I, my, in my opinion, Golang is just, it just has the best abstractions in place for zero trust connectivity, which makes a lot of sense because you know, a lot of people use Golang for microservices, but it's just fantastic. Uh, so here's an example. Um, I wrote this, I don't even know if it still works, so we're going to explore this one together, but basically I went to Google and I asked for what Postgres drivers people use. And they told me that uh, the Postgres driver lots of people use nowadays is this Jack C PGX Postgres driver. So I said, okay, I'll use that. Sounds good. Uh, I tend to, I tend to look for ones that are supported by a larger organization than what uh, seems to be one fella, but a lot of things in the go ecosystem are supported by one individual. So it's not so surprising. Well, here's our main function. You can see the first thing it does is it calls a PGX function again from this Jack C fella to parse config. And now here is where one of those cool and annoying differences of different programming languages and runtimes comes to play. This library parse config requires the host name 
to be resolvable. It's so very helpful, right? Like you're a developer, you put in your host name. In fact, we'll put in Zetified Postgres right here. Zetified Postgres, because that's what we want to connect to. And we write our little code and we you know, feel good. We go and we execute it. Again, um, compiling slow. We'll wait for this thing to do its, do its job. And then we'll demonstrate what I'm trying to show you. So, you know, you, you get your Java example running, you go and you write your Golang example and, and it says, I did failed. And you're like, what do you mean it failed? And it's failed connect to host equals Zetified Postgres. And you're like, well, of, of course that fails. I'm using zero trust. I don't want you, Mr. Library author, to go and hold my hand on this one. I appreciate it sometimes, but on this one, I need an escape hatch because Zetified Postgres is a name I just invented. Like, I, it does not exist. You can't ping it. Of course, it's not going to work. So when I first wrote this example, I was a little annoyed. But then also notice another fun thing. I use port one. So let's use port zero instead, which is a valid port. And uh, let's change this to 127.0.0.1. Another one. I don't care what port it is, right? I'm using zero trust. I'm using OpenZD. I don't care about the port number. So let's go ahead and I'll use 127.0.0.1. I'll, I'll fake out the driver. It'll know that 127.0.0.1, of course, exists. And then what's the driver going to do is it's going to check that port and make sure that your port is also valid. Like, come on. Uh, I, what I didn't try is actually removing the port. Let's remove the port entirely because then it'll probably use port 5432, I would expect. So this should at least go and, and get further along. All right, it does. All right, connection refused. So this got further along. Now we have placated the driver. The driver no longer cares that I, you know 127.0.0.1 is not resolvable because it is. Um, and then we go and we bootstrap our ZD context and you'll see I have my Postgres driver in at this location, but that's not where I put the PG file from before. So what I do need to do is I need to copy my P PG. Oh, is it client or client? Well, this is right. Hyphen. Copy PG client to here, it's an underscore as well. So I need to update that identity because I've used it. I've torn down the whole network. It's all brand new. So it was saying my dial failed, failed to dial, no API session, authentication attempt failed. I couldn't authenticate because I've torn down this entire OpenZD overlay network. And so what I'm doing is I'm making my new ZD context from file. And then I call my example with OpenZD which is a simple little function that just configures the PGX connection config with my dial function. And this is a great thing about Golang. It has these notions of dial functions. So most connectivity type interfaces you'll find in Golang will have things like uh, they'll return a net con and that net con or they'll return a net listener. And those are standard Golang libraries, um, libraries, structs, I guess structs, uh, interfaces, be a better word, standard Golang interfaces that represent your connection. And that's what OpenZD also uses. And you'll see this PGX uh, library also uses a connection, um, a netcon. So when you look at, actually, does the client config? Yeah, right there. It returns a con. And a con is a PG con, and a PG con is a net con. So you can see that PGX, the Postgres library, also uses um, extends. I don't know what the right term is because it's not quite extends, but uh, composes a net con into itself. So the PGX connection is a net con, and a, an OpenZD connection is also a net con in the same exact way. So what this does is it adds the dialer, which is another common interface that you'll see in uh, Golang. It adds the dialer to the connection configuration, and then it just calls PGX connect config. And if you go and you look at their sample code, like all of this, the, like what I've added in here, I think is these, these lines. And then of course I had to muck with the um, URL, but 
these are the these are the lines that are different between their type of sample code and what I had to do. I just had to learn that there is a connect config function that allows me to supply a config. And if I do those things, then my dialer will be used to create that socket <coughs> or in Golang world to create that connection. And so now if I go ahead and run this, this I, I think should just succeed. And so we'll see if it does. No. Okay. Zedified Postgres is not found. So now it's telling me that this identity service, Zedified Postgres, was not found. If I come back to my code here and run my ZD Edge list services, it's because I called it private Postgres, not Zedified Postgres. So instead of Zedified Postgres, I'll call that private Postgres. Try again. This time, will it work? Hey, there it goes. So now I've also connected to my private Postgres database using uh, Golang in Amazon with no port 5432 exposed in Docker with no port 5432 exposed. And yet I can still do that from here in my local computer to through Amazon. And so that's, um, and so that's connecting to a totally private Postgres using the Golang SDK. Now, the one more thing I was going to show you if I had time, I had two more things. One is the OpenZD appetizer. That's, I'm going to go and, and show that again. I think the last time I demonstrated this, it was before our uh, All Things Open expedition. And so this has changed <laughs> dramatically from the first time around. But right now you can go out here and try it yourself. I challenge you, if you're watching, if you have Golang, and if you don't work for NetFoundry or OpenZD, go ahead and try this out. Go to appetizer.openzd.io and add an email address or something unique. If you want to give us your email, you can. You know, maybe Philip will pester you, but, you know, hopefully it's not too much. Or just add some, you know, some unique flair. If you don't make it unique, you have a chance of stomping somebody else because this is just a demo and it's not meant to be used for anything other than a demo. And you can always just choose don't bother me this right now if you want. So I'm going to click don't bother me. You see, when I do that, I'm going to come out. I'm going to get a nice little web page that our nice designer created. looks a lot better than what I generally produce. It says, hey, great. Uh, now you need to go and clone this repository. And so I'm going to be a dutiful person, and I'm going to go and I'm going to clone that repository. So let's make a new uh, temp folder, maker app. Let's see the app. Git. Let's sneeze. Pardon, pardon me. I'm so sorry. All right. Um, so now I'm going to uh, git clone. Oops, I already had the git clone in there. Appetizer, cd to the appetizer. Okay. So once I've done that, it says I can now save my token to the cloned repo. So I run WSL. I have this little where am I alias. It tells me where I am so that when I click download token, I can just save it to that location. Now I can run one of the three examples of the appetizer. The first example simply connects you to an HTTP service and runs a curl command, effectively an HTTP get. And so I can run that right here. And what will come back is a hello from the, uh, the web server. And you can see the first time I run this, it notices that the JWT is brand new. So it enrolls me. And so you, if you wanted to see how you would enroll in a device, you can go and look at this code and see how to do that in Go. And it says hello from IP 1061.16. And so that, if you'll notice, where's my, oh, actually I'm in the right window. That is not this address. It's not the same server. Um, this is a server that runs out in Fargate somewhere. So we have a container that runs this in Fargate in Amazon. So I don't even know where it is, but this is an application embedded zero trust server. So I took the Golang SDK and I put it into the server side on this one and we ran it in Fargate, which is a container based deployment model. So I don't even know where it runs. It runs out in Amazon 
Fargate somewhere. Um, and so that's the hello example. The math example you can run, it's the same exact thing. It goes to the same exact server and then returns to you the results of whatever your little math is, right? And so here's my result. Do note that if you run this inside of bash, like I am, you do need to quote a star, otherwise it will glob and won't work. And so there's those results, so that's cool. But the, the fun one is this um, reflex server, because the reflex server also runs in the same location, but it's it's running um, a, a little a little program that knows how to relay messages back to you on the screen. So if you say hi, this is the appetizer demo. You'll see up on you know I'm gonna hide my video. You'll see that it popped up down there. Hi, this is the appetizer demo. So if you're live, you could do this right now. Otherwise, you'll just see this when you go to this page. Um, and then what we did that's also neat is the server in Fargate land calls another server that lives somewhere else. I don't remember where Ken, my normal co-host, deployed it, but that server is running somewhere and it is classifying this text. So if I say, uh, where's my cursor? Babies are ugly. Then our, <laughs> our, um, our classifier is not working. It's supposed to say uh, that your text is not valid, but I think the classifier is down. Uh, so let's look, let's look. I have, um, yeah, no, babies are ugly. It's apparently allowing that. Uh, I, I did not expect that. I expected that to send back something else. What if I write the word damn? Nope, that shows up too. Looks like our content filter is not working correctly because uh, you're not supposed to be able to see these kind of messages. It's supposed to send you a message telling you to, you know, be nice and, and don't be, don't be nasty. Um, but anyway, you can see from our, like I said, you can try that right now. Anybody watching this in the future, please try it out. If, in fact, in fact, let's do that fun little YouTube thing. If you are watching this in the future, put a message into here that says, I came from whatever. I, I say that because then if I go look at the logs, I'll be able to see somebody actually watch the video, ran the Golang example, and that'll be exciting. So if you don't work for NetFoundry, because we have a lot of jokers here at NetFoundry, or if you don't work on the OpenZD project, same thing, uh, try it out. If you do work for that, please tell me that you work for NetFoundry. So I, I don't think that somebody, you know, some random is doing this. Anyway, that's the appetizer. And now oh, I wanted to move the database. That was the other one. I wanted to move where my database lived. So right now my database exclusively lives in Amazon. What if I made a database locally? Could I make a database that is running local and do all the same sorts of stuff that I did out here in Amazon land? Uh, first thing I want to do is cat that Docker compose because I really just want, I want Stuff right here. Postgres up. In fact, I want Postgres and I want a ZD router. So I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do in the next 10 minutes is connect a new router to my public router that's in the sky and make it so that I can send data from my local computer to that router and then that router send data into my Docker environment. And I've never done this before, so this could go down in flames, but I thought I'd try it out to see just how hard it would be because it should be relatively straightforward. I mostly know what I'm doing when it comes to OpenZ, and so we should be able to make that happen. The first thing I need to do, actually, let's make a little new PowerPoint. So I've got my, I've got my uh, Amazon environment. Oh, actually, I got the better. I can go back and get, I can get all this. I can just get all this. Yeah. So I've got my Amazon environment, and what I really want to do, because this is, in fact, this is running somewhere else. I, I want this is running in Amazon. All right. So this is an Ubuntu machine in Amazon. Let's. Can I edit this? Can I edit this? Why won't you let me edit this? Edit. Did I copy the entire thing? Why does that look like the entire thing? 
This is path to Postgres. I don't know why that looks like the entire thing. Why won't you let me edit you? Group, ungroup. What's okay? That's better. You may yeah, fine. Okay. Well, this is going to be annoying because that's not All right. You let me move that. Okay, you let me move that. Why won't you let me? I don't know why I won't let me type. Whatever. Fine. I'm going to just shrink this all down. Let's group this. Group, 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 group. Where is group? I can't group it. PowerPoint. Why are you failing me? Already grouped? Is that why? All right. So let's shrink this down. Oh, my goodness. This is driving me bananas. Watching me fail at PowerPoint. Why won't PowerPoint let me group? Oh, my God. Whatever. All right. So this is what I want to do. I want to have this Ubuntu machine up there running in Amazon land. And I don't want... I want my Postgres. I don't want my controller. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go away. Oh, not that one. This one. There we go. Oh, my goodness. And I want this to come from here, like that. Okay, I need to bring this to the front. And I want my Postgres database to be in my Docker environment, like this. And so I'm, at the end of the day, I'm going to have two databases, one in Amazon, and I really wish it would let me type the word AWS in there. All right, we're going to do this, AWS. <laughs> there we go. Now it says AWS machine. How do I make it bigger? Home, and we'll make this bigger. There we go. All right. So I want... There we go. Ubuntu machine there. And now this is Clint's house over here. So I'm going to run my Golang SDK. It will end up communicating to the controller that's out in the cloud. And I can't, can I convert this to a elbow? I can. All right. And then I'll do this. And then, all right, whatever. This is just, it's just all got, it's just not good. You're going to have to just deal with it. All right. So, It'll connect to my controller out in the cloud. My Golang SDK will be able to connect to my edge router locally and then send traffic to my Postgres locally or to here. It'll be, I'll be able to do either and I'll be able to demonstrate, um, actually, maybe I'll take this public edge router and make it not public. And that way I won't need to do Postgres at all. I can do it, I can make that router only public to links and have it have 3022 not accept connections well in this case it's 8440 because i'm i've overridden it connect it that way i can do that too so let's start off by connecting an edge router we'll start there because i think that's what we need to start with so let's go ahead and start by connecting an edge router in order to connect an edge router gd edge create edge router and uh help I need to give it a name. So we'll say uh, private Clint private ER. And then I didn't have an output file, which is too bad because I need I do need the output file. So Z the edge delete edge router Clint private ER. And so now I'll create and I'll output the Clint private ER.jwt file. Okay, that is in November 10th. I want to do that on my local computer. So um, cd dot dot slash dot dot victor new router cd to new router and then scp cd aws nov 10 c p e r g w t to here. All right, and that's important. Now is cd on this path? It is. All right, that's important because in order to run my edge router locally. I'm going to need to enroll it locally. So I need a JWT so I can enroll my so that I can enroll my edge router. Now I'm going to ZD Edge and actually it's CD config create edge router. I think. No. Create config. Config. Yeah. Uh, router. And I'm going to run an edge. I want it to be private. So 
I'm gonna give it a name, Clint Private ER Private. Outer name, not set. All right, and so what that'll do is it'll generate a config file. And then I'm gonna send this to my cper.yaml. So if I look at cper.yaml, you'll see that I have a location for where it's gonna put its certificates, fine. I have an endpoint where the controller, it expects to find the controller, which is incorrect right now. I have a link dialer. I do not have a link listener. I have a listener of edge binding on, on 3022. So it'll bind that. It'll advertise my host name, which is fine because this connection is going to be from local host. And uh, it'll allow me to tunnel. I can turn this off too. I don't need this router to host anything. So I could choose to turn that off. And so that's my uh, configuration file. Now, um, if I run this again, I don't know if I can specify. I can't specify the controller. I, that should be a flag that we should, we allow people to specify because that now I have to go and I have to VI this file. So my endpoint is going to be, uh, let's see, I'm on, now I'm back on the, I got to get into Docker now. So if I Docker exec minus IT, actually let's do a Docker compose. And then we'll go into uh, the ZD controller. Mesh. IT, oh, I did it. Docker compose exec IT. ZD controller is not running. PS ZT console controller one PG. Oh, I, I didn't give it the PG. Uh, minus PG, no, minus P, PG. Minus P, yeah, minus project, right? Project PG. Doesn't not like it here. All right, we'll just do it the hard way because that's being a pain. Doctor exec minus IT. Now I'm on, that's the Postgres, I want the uh, um, controller, PG, CD, controller. Now I'm on the controller. And what I wanted from the controller was to CD to ZD home and to look at the um, ZD uh, controller YAML. I wanted to find the advertised address from this thing, advertised address. This is the address that the API exists at, but I, what I want to find is up at the beginning, there is another one which represents the control plane of the, the ZD controller. Where is, there it is, control listener. Nope, that's a listener. I want to know the advertised address. It's a ET2, it should be 8440, but I'm trying to find it in the, Let's look for 8440. Oh, right. Because it's the controller. Ah, my bad. So this is this is what I wanted to find. The port. 8440. All right. So let's let me get the address. That's what I put down here. And then 8440. All right. Now I need to enroll my router. CD edge and roll no ZD router and roll at that time oh, CD router and roll help see I have to provide the JWT file and the and and the config file so we will provide the config file, which is cper, cper.yaml, and we will provide the JWT. And so if this succeeds, my registration will be complete. There we go. And so now I should be able to run ZD router run cper.yaml. Okay, fatal. What did I screw up? 
Express tunnel unable to authenticate. Ensure the tunneler mode is enabled for this router. Or disable the tunneler listener. Let's see per animal. Listeners. Filers. Listeners. Okay. So I turned off the tunneler per its instructions. Now if I come back to my ZD command, do ZD edge list ERs, you'll see now I have two edge routers. So I have my private edge router that's running locally, and I have my uh, existing public edge router. Well, I'm going to ZD edge update edge router minus A. I'm going to clear out my edge routers attributes. So now when I list my edge routers, you'll see I have no public edge routers. <clears throat> and if I go back to my go based example again, and I run my go based example, of course, this will fail. And it will fail because now I have no public edge routers. And so what I want to do is I want to make this public, uh, I want to make my private edge router local and public so that I'm able to connect to it. And you can see no edge routers are assigned and online. So next thing I'll do is I'll ZD edge update edge router. Now let's just copy it. Copy it correctly. And we'll give this an attribute of public. And when that gets an attribute of public, now suddenly this edge router is able to accept connections. And so now when I run my example, this should traverse the fabric, assuming I did it correctly. This should traverse the fabric, successfully get into Amazon and successfully return me results. Bam, super cool stuff. So now I have a, a, a ZD overlay network. It looks like this except uh, I have a link between this edge router, which is private, this runs in my local computer. All of this is local computer stuff. I'll make it a different color so that we can see that it's, that doesn't work. Maybe that's why it's not working. It's some weird, I don't know. It's, we're not gonna fight with PowerPoint anymore. So I have a, a locally running edge router that's totally private. Nobody on the internet can get to it. Just me and also it's just me because if I look at the cper.yaml again, the advertised address that it's advertising is just my host name. So if you if you can't resolve SG3U22, you could never connect to it, but also there's no firewall, so you can't connect to it. So I have my edge router running locally in my house to a public edge router that has no listening ports to the outside world for Postgres. It only listens for router connections. That's the only thing you can send to it, router connections. And of course, my controller is also out there. The traffic comes in from Golang, goes to this edge router, traverses the fabric, exits over here in Amazon, in Docker, and uh, it all works. Great. I, I mean, I'm pleased as punch. It took me like 15 minutes, not 10, but I mean, you know, I was probably because I was fumbling with PowerPoint for like eight minutes. And that's going to be ZDTV for this week. So I hope that you have enjoyed ZDTV. Uh, oh, I, for, I haven't been on camera for a while now. I'm sorry. I know the world demands to see. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this ZDTV. I think we covered some cool ground today. We saw how to connect to a private Postgres database with Java. We saw how to do it with Golang. We then made our, uh, we saw the appetizer. Uh, I didn't show the code for the appetizer, but if you're interested, hit me up. We can talk about the code. And we saw how to turn that public router uh, into a, basically a private router and add a router to our overlay network all in the span of an hour. Well, that was fun. Uh, I've enjoyed myself. Hopefully, you know, you stuck around and watched something. Maybe you learned a thing or two. Hope you had fun and we'll see you.